executive officer. So he'll just share us uh, uh, on uh, today's topic and also his background and anything he would want to share. So Jack, on to you. Uh, sorry for the delay and we can start now. Great, thank you, Rodas. <clears throat> Hi everyone, nice to meet you all. Um, so my name is Jacques, um, and I've had, I've had, uh, I've worked with Ten Academy for many years now. Um, my background is I was actually an academic. I I studied physics and um, data science, and I did my PhD at UCT in South Africa, and that's where I had the good fortune of meeting Yababel. And um, we studied together and we became good friends through that experience. Uh, subsequently, I was very lucky to go and do research overseas. I, I worked at Stanford for a while and I was at Oxford for a while and ICG as well. I then got corrupted into the dark side, as I like to call it. And I worked in investment banking for a few years. That's what took me to London. And there I work at Barclays Capital as a quantitative analyst. And we did lots of interesting things. We had a fantastic, diverse team of scientists working there. And um, during my time in London, I got interested in what was happening in the startup community. So I packed up banking and ended up going into startups. And I helped found uh, an ad tech business called Adludio. And again, I was very lucky in that um, we managed to get Yabi to come and work with us. And we uh, recruited a lot of the graduates from 10 Academy to come and work with us at, at Ludio and develop a, a data science team. And that became fundamental to what became the core offering for at Ludio in the future. I worked there for about 10 years and then eventually left uh, just over a year ago. Um, and now, subsequently, I've started looking at AI again, which is something we we first were introduced uh, to when I was doing my PhD. And of course, there's so many exciting things that have happened. And there were so many wonderful experiences of applying AI at, at Ludio that I decided, I decided to not learn my from my previous mistakes and go ahead and uh, start another business. So with that, I'll share my screen quickly. <clears throat> I've decided to put together a quick presentation for everyone. And I was trying to think from the pers perspective of all of you who have just started out in your, or will just be starting out in your careers and um, looking to position yourself for what's happening in AI in 2024. So 2023 was a spectacular year for AI, so much happened in such short time. So how can we prepare for that? And how can we be well positioned for what's going to happen in 2024? So first of all, this graph, I think very clearly captures how excited everyone is about AI. This is a graph from 2007 all the way to 2023, showing the very sudden and incremental rise in the in AI on Hacker News, which is sort of the the pulse of where a lot of startup founders and developers and hackers hang out. So this is an early indicator that, of course, everything every, everyone is talking about is AI. And we all know that. This quote, I think, is very significant given that news. Um, it's in my lifetime, I've seen two demonstrations of technology that struck me as revolutionary. The GUI, graphical user interface, and chat GPT. And that, of course, was said by none other than Bill Gates. So when Uncle Bill says something like that, we should all pay attention. What does this mean? Potentially, it's, I think it's very evident that it signals a platform shift. What on earth is a platform shift? The tech industry is very cyclical, and we go through these boom and sort of bust eras where a new technology really revolutionizes how we do business and how, we, how it affects our lives. And those cycles generally happen in 10 to 15 years. First, there was the mainframes, then there were PCs, then, of course, there was open, the web and open source smartphones, 
the cloud, and now generative AI. So there's going to be a distinct shift in how most things are built, how businesses operate, and the kind of services we, um, we can leverage because of this platform shift. These cycles usually happen in S curves. Um, so, you know, it, there's a, this is a sort of a slow but interesting adoption right in the beginning until it gets to a point where it becomes more applicable and more exciting. And then, of course, the excitement wears off. So a good example of this is if we take a look where smartphones are at the moment. Everyone knows about smartphones. Everyone knows how useful smartphones are. But you'd be hard pushed to try and think of a new smartphone app or new application using your smartphone in some way. No doubt there will still be a few out there, but it's far harder to do, and it's it's um, it's not as exciting and open in terms of what is possible. Machine learning has been around for a while now. People can definitely see the applications of how machine learning is useful and how it um, can do a lot of take remove a lot of complexity from everyday uh, tasks. So that's definitely in the excitement curve. But generative machine learning is definitely at a very, very early stage. Um, and people are more at the point where they're kind of going, this is something that's going to change things, but I don't quite know how. I don't quite know how I'm going to use this. And most of the applications are actually more like toys or demonstrations of how powerful it could be, but there's no real killer application as yet. That's a good thing. That's very exciting. So what does this mean for 2024? <clears throat> I've, I've taken a stab at a few things, and I'll just show you a few thoughts that are bubbling around in my, in my head to kind of um, lay the, the, the landscape or the battlefield of what I think some of the key uh, points will be. First of all, as we start using AI more and more, whether it's for an, uh, an endpoint for an application or to remove some of the redundant uh, development that was done and use AI to uh, extrapolate a lot of complexity that normally would be done in code. We will move to more and more production uh, implementations of AI. That means that DevOps, if you're not familiar with DevOps, it's um, imagine the person who's responsible for architecture on AWS. That's usually a DevOps person who, um, or you know, the person that's making sure that your code is deployed and has all the correct unit tests, functional tests, um, you know, is containerized, has all the necessary documentation. And on AWS, you're making sure that you are monitoring certain thresholds of your CPU usage, your memory usage, all of these operational things that if they go wrong, or they pose risks to the product, the production pipeline breaking down will mean that your application no longer works. Those will become more and more important in the world of AI. It's very new how AI is used. So those tools don't necessarily exist yet. And it's a very new and emerging field that there'll be plenty of opportunity for and will be very helpful um, to have as a skill. Next, if you haven't heard of RAG, it's something called Retrieval Augmented Generation. And basically, um, to explain the problem in the simplest way, LLMs, these large language models, um, are monolithic models in general, huge models that are trained on tons and tons of data, very expensive to build, but they usually have a cutoff point. So. Uh, you know, I think GPT-3 or 3.5, it cuts off somewhere in September 2021. I think uh, ChatGPT-4 is somewhere in April 2023. I can't remember exactly. But 
effectively they represent a snapshot in time of what they were trained on. So anything subsequent to that training period um, is not assimilated. They are unfamiliar with it. So they're not very useful on something that's new and relevant. RAG is a good way of supplementing that because it's a way of almost creating a, uh, a bolt-on of information that could be more contextually relevant or just new information that isn't necessarily included in the training set for the LLM. That means that uh, that information can now still be leveraged through the LLM and you can add your information to it and then you can still do very useful things, arguably more useful things with the fact that you have something that's more contextually relevant. So RAG is a very simple implementation of that, but uh, there will be new forms of RAG that really improve the efficiency and um, really push the envelope in terms of being able to increase the accuracy, improve the cost, and improve the efficiency of any queries put on, on that RAG. So I see lots of development there. Of course, LLMs. <laughs> There'll be a huge smorgasbord of LLMs. The big ones will continue to get bigger. You know, this ChatGPT5 will come out soon. I'm sure uh, Google will take up the, the race as well and continue to push with their next version of Gemini, etc. And those big models will probably get bigger and better. I'm looking forward to that. But an interesting thing is, of course, um, the landscape of open source uh, large language models, which are freely available, trained on generally smaller uh, training sets, but are punch way above their weight in certain circumstances. And it's more like an array of tools that you can use for specific uses. And the nice thing about those, L those smaller open source LLMs, so you can use them privately for sensitive data or very specific things, perhaps in combination with RAG, and get very good performance. So understanding and staying on top of what's happening in the LLM space will be critical to everyone's development and leveraging the potential applications for um, AI in 2024. This one's interesting because it looks kind of old. Uh, I put here machine learning pattern recognition. But I think what I'm specifically referencing here is um, visual pattern, pattern recognition. So it's identifying things. Um, it's a very interesting split in the world at the moment. If you take a look generally at the West or in America or somewhere, um, most of the usage that people are currently using AI for is LLMs. So just going and you know, generating text lots of innovative ideas on how you can do that. Um, but if you take a look at the East or China, they mainly use it for facial recognition. I think there's probably, and for good reason, there are privacy concerns in the US about doing that uh, on a broad scale like China necessarily does, but it's probably an indicator <clears throat> that there's an area in, um, you know, visual recognition, pattern recognition that hasn't been well explored in the in the West, and it's probably going to be an emerging trend. Um, so I'm interested to see what kind of applications are going to come out of more engaging with the physical world and using leveraging uh, machine learning to be able to more easily and accessibly uh, start doing very complex tasks using pattern recognition. So the next one is uh, a generative image and video. And for those of you that have been watching the progress that's been happening happening on things like Mid Journey, um, uh, I've just gone blank on the uh, Runway is another one that's a video AI generating platform. They're just incredible. I mean, the, the progress that's happened there over the last three months is probably perhaps even the last month 
has been um, the most breakneck in terms of development, I think we've seen throughout the entire 2023, which is definitely saying something. And I see that trend continuing. So I think definitely in 2024, it's very likely that um, you know generative AI and eventually full videos will be very efficiently generated using machine learning and these uh, visual generative models. Testing, um, this is a, a sort of a catch-all. It, it's very similar to the DevOps that I, that I mentioned previously, but in a rapidly evolving um, area such as AI, LLMs and finding applications for all of these different tools that are available, it becomes increasingly important to be able to compare apples with apples. So having a standard set of testing um, uh, a testing kit to determine how efficient my RAG is, how efficient my LLM is at solving particular problems becomes very important. And you can see as we kind of stand at the point where things are just going to get more diverse, they're going to be more options, this becomes more and more important. Because, um, you know, especially if you're familiar with the open source world, sometimes something would fork just for the sake of forking, where you had two versions and it was very difficult to tell. It was a philosophical choice between the one version and the other version, which is all very well and good. But if you really want to apply these tools, you have to have some sort of determining factor that says, this one's better for this use, this one's better for this use. And that's where testing becomes very important. And again, there are attempts to do it, but there's no consolidated, uniform, um, agreed upon set of tests that you can use to determine how effective some of these tools are. So that will be an area that will definitely progress in the next year. And lastly, um, not exactly in the field of uh, uh, large language models or, or machine learning, but definitely um, a near relative is of course robotics. Um, you know, applying smart software especially to simple things like drones, um, I think will become more and more, or we'll see more and more of that, and we'll find some very innovative uh, uses for doing that moving forward. Of course, um, <laughs> I've spelt that horribly wrong, but that is code interpreter. So uh, th this trend of uh, large language models being able to either translate one set of code to another or uh, things like Microsoft Copilot where you can, it will guide you through uh, coding within your favorite IDE. These will become more and more functional and we'll see more and more applications where you can take a design from Figma and you can run it through a particular AI and uh, I think there are a few out there already that do 80 or 90% of this and will produce completely clean, editable code uh, in whatever choice you have for a website, an application, anything like that. And it will become pretty crazy, I think, to the point where you can pretty much sketch out what you want to do, give a brief description of it, and you can have the code generated. Um, or you can have an, an agent that just runs and, and uh, creates all the necessary API connections for you and codes them up overnight. So, you know, lots of future development in the space of code interpreters. I think that's it. Um, so out of all of these things, this is just a personal choice. It's not necessarily what I think will have the biggest impact. It's just what I think are probably the most exciting things to be aware of. Um, so the things I'm most looking forward to in 2024, agents. So if you don't know what an agent is, um, if you're, you're probably not old enough to remember something called Clippy <laughs> within Word, uh, Microsoft, 
where it was a little assistant that would pop up while you started writing a letter or started writing something in a Word document. And it would say, I see you trying to write a letter. How can I help? So the idea of an agent is very much that, where you know, if you take how we currently use ChatGPT, it's giving a particular task to an LLM. So we direct the LLM on what to do. Um, and they usually like, if you think about it, they're actually very straightforward um, things that you could delegate to somebody to do. But something that takes more cognitive capacity, some more logic in terms of developing a strategy and then executing on the strategy and determining what all the subtasks to that strategy are, that's something more in the realm of an agent. So an example would be, very simple esoteric example would be, um, imagine you had a remote control robot in a maze. At the moment, we use LLMs um, in that way, where we say, go forward 10, turn right 90, go forward 100, and you can guide the, the little robot through the maze to get from one point to another. An agent, on the other hand, you would give the instruction to find your, find your way out of the maze, and then it would self-delegate to itself um, exactly to explore and have a heuristic or strategy for trying to get out. And it would remember the paths that didn't work and the paths that did work until eventually it would find its way out. So those type of that type of logic and that type of abstraction from just so it's basically AI that sits on top of an LLM, understands what the task or objective is about, builds a strategy, and then figures out exactly what the steps are that are needed and then perhaps delegates even in a swarm delegates um, spawns several subtasks to make sure that it can get that objective completed how can you use this this is something i'm i'm currently playing with in our own business um, where it's actually looking at business objectives so an example would be help me improve my um my marketing reach help me you know help more businesses know about me and how can i elevate my business so that people can see how how much of a good job we're doing um, you can have agents that would be able to work out a strategy because it's pretty straightforward in terms of saying well um now how strong are you on social media what kind of advertising campaigns do you currently have do you have a newsletter? How well does your SEO rank for your website? Um, and then based on that information, I can then go and figure out, well, it looks like you're, you have a poor following on social media or you're not posting very regularly on social media. And then I can build the appropriate steps to improve those overall um, indicators of how visible I am as a business. Uh, and it can actually be very good because you're basically chaining together a set of LLM prompts that we know work well uh, and then you're closing the loop in the sense that you're then connecting to maybe your social media uh, channels, um, you're measuring traffic to your website and you're uh, building a newsletter uh, for your subscribers and you understand your audience really well of who you're trying to reach. So you take all of those elements together and you can have a very effective result in terms of being able to build um, uh, good results for a business objective. So before I move on to the next one, I've got something in brackets there that says not AGI. Now this is a bit more of a controversial one. So uh, for those of you that don't know the acronym, um, it stands for artificial general intelligence and the um, idea behind that that's the whole mission behind open ai <clears throat> there they want to try and uh, figure out how to get to agi and agi is like reaching a human level intelligent 
where you can ask an AI to do absolutely anything and it would be able to respond at the same or better than a human out there. So some of you that have used ChatGPT might think, well, we're very close, we're very close. And honestly, if you take a look at how far we've come in the last year, <laughs> how massive the, the progression has been, it's easy to agree. Um, but, you know, I think it's too easy to say we're going to hit AGI. I think for those of you that have worked in development or any hard science, you probably know <laughs> the old saying that, um, you know, it, the last 90% of the work happens in the in the last 10% of perfecting something. And I wouldn't be surprised if that's the case with AGI. Um, everyone is kind of predicting that it's going to happen this year. I thought just to be a little controversial, I would say hmm, it, I, it wouldn't surprise me if it if it pushes through until next year. I would love to see it happen this year because it has fascinating uh, socio-economic implications, especially from a political po point of view. It, it really changes how things will work. And we need to rethink if capitalism is, is um, set up for something like an economy built on AGI. Um, but, you know, I think if I have to make a bet, I would say I'd be comfortable with saying that's probably going to stand up until next year. Videos and movies, as we discussed previously, you know, the development that we have seen on the um, the imagery and video rendering for um, these machine learning models or these uh, generation models is incredible. So I think we're really not far away. And before the end of the year, we will see a full um, AI generated movie or video Maybe even if it's just a short movie, I think that will definitely happen and it will look phenomenal. It will be of the quality of Pixar or a similar movie um, where you just, you know, I think will be astounded at how much it will bring down the cost for just an average person to put together a story and uh, Im imagine the visuals for it and then generate something that goes along with it. So that will be super exciting and then my other one which again is maybe um a little bit out there and i perhaps haven't got a well formulated idea of how this one is going to change but i think the opportunity is rife because many people haven't spoken about it is image and pattern recognition um you know there's some very obvious applications that you could imagine happening in the next couple of months, I'm sure there might even be a few out there already, where for example, you take a picture of your food and through the use of image recognition and pattern recognition, you'll be able to identify what the dish is, what some of the ingredients are, and have a calorie breakdown of what that dish is and what the macronutrients of that dish is. Um, that, Honestly, I mean, I think that's very doable. I'm 100% sure somebody's going to do that if they haven't already done, done it. But I think there's going to be something even more phenomenal that somebody can do. What that is, I'm not 100% sure. Um, you know, that's part of the <laughs> the interesting thing about making predictions is, um, you know, sometimes you know an area it's going to happen in, but. Uh, Trust me, if I had that great idea, I'd probably do it. Um, an example of something that I imagine we might not expect is something like, let's say, for example, there's an app where you can now go and take a picture of a suspicious looking skin blemish or mole and um, it crowdsources or it's been trained on a specific set of melanomas or uh, suspicious looking um, growths and it can give you a percentage confidence on how dangerous that particular mole or blemish or whatever it might be and um, you know it discovers a whole new it, it becomes more effective at doing that that than actually going and seeing a doctor 
that's what I expect. Something, you know, that we might not have perhaps thought of as very straightforward to do, but once we do it, it actually gets better than what we expected it to do in this sort of image recognition and, and um, pattern recognition um, area. So if we're going to make a list of things that we're looking forward to, I think it's important to consider the things that I'm not looking forward to as well. Um, so the first one is this sort of fake news. I think, you know, election misinformation, we saw what happened in 2016, 2020, and 2024 is only going to get worse. Um, and I'm specifically thinking of the US here uh, because that's kind of fresh uh, fresh on the horizon and bound to have lots of controversy. I think it's probably bad for the whole world because um, there's going to be a lot of these techniques employed in, um, also in all democracies around the world, perhaps autocracies as well. Um, and I think it will take a while for us to catch up on how being, uh, on being able to squash uh, these types of fake news and images that go along with that. You know, suddenly we'll see images of Donald Trump being arrested and um, abused by the police just to rile up his base. Um, and we know the way human nature works is the more controversial, the more juicy something is, the more likely it is to spread like wildfire um, without it being fact-checked. And that's going to happen a lot in the, in the coming years until we have a good solution for it, which we definitely don't. The other one is definitely a needed aspect of what's happening in artificial intelligence. There are lots of ethical concerns that we need to consider with any new technology and especially with ones um, that are going to be as empowered as AI. Um, biases will creep in because at the end of the day, we are extrapolating information from data. That data generally, in most cases, is susceptible to bias. So we have to make sure that, especially if it's, um, you know, sort of a human-based study or something that we feed through the internet because biases already exist on the internet. So whether it's gender, religion, race, those biases we have to be very careful about. Um, that I think is probably best um, dealt with by experts in the field of AI. Um, I feel uncomfortable about uh, AI legislation just because I know who the legislators are <laughs> and they're generally badly informed um, and whether you are in the camp where you think that there should be as little legislation as possible and there should be as much freedom to experiment with AI as possible or you are in the camp of saying there are clearly um, social, political uh, implications and, you know, moral implications of you AI that we need to consider and we need to make sure that government steps in to legislate those. I think both, both of those sides at the end of the day will be disappointed with the legislation that is brought out by the authorities. So I'm not looking forward to that. As needed as it is, I I expect that the first version will probably fail. <laughs> We've all seen uh, the atrocities of the war in Ukraine and now in Gaza and Israel. And I think a very clear emerging trend that's happened there is the use of drone warfare. Um, you know, from ordinary commercial drones that have uh, makeshift explosive strap to them and then flown into tanks or into boats. Um, it, the, the, the genie's out the bottle and, um, you know, clearly there'll be more and more applications used, um, especially, and that those efforts will be accelerated after seeing how effective these sort of very simple methods were 
um, in, in Ukraine, for example. So that is an area that is going to probably get a lot of funding and um, probably grow and we'll see some pretty scary things over the next few years be developed in, the, in that area. So now the important thing for you guys, and I'll move through this quite quickly because I see we're running out of time. <clears throat> the general skills, you know, when it comes to AI, um, you know, and given what we've now just spoken about, what does this mean for you guys? I think the first thing is you can't neglect the general skills that you need. Um, this is regardless of whether you're just a developer, whether you focused on AI, whether you focused on blockchain, these are fundamental skills that you need. You need to understand business. You need to understand, um, you know, one of the biggest challenges I saw with, especially in science, coming from science and working in commerce, um, is people don't have a good appreciation when somebody in the sales department or the marketing department asks you to do something it's very important for them not to tell you what to do but for you to understand what they're actually trying to accomplish because very often uh, especially if it's a senior person they might think they understand the science or the technical uh, specifications needed to accomplish what they want, but they don't. That's your field of expertise. Your requirements to make that a success is to really understand that, ah, this salesperson is looking to understand what their sales pipeline looks like and who is most likely to convert based on historic information. That is an, a powerful skill to have and to have that context and then be able to go, okay, based on what you've told me, I now have a good idea of how I can help you solve that problem. But you must have the skill of understanding what they're actually trying to accomplish. Remember, at the end of the day, if you want to call yourself a scientist, you can't say, oh, well, the commercial world's completely different. It's the same rule. In science, the quality of the question and understand, making the question as clear as possible is the best way to actually do good science. It's the same principle in business. Having a quality question or having clear context on what is trying to be accomplished gives you the freedom and creativity and the clarity needed to do good work. Um, there's a whole world of being disciplined and good about how you code. You know, it's like the difference between being a theoretical physicist and being an engineer that's a, a construction engineer that specializes in building bridges. I'm sure the theoretical physicist would understand how a bridge is built, but there are certain rules on the, in the process of building a bridge that the theoretical physicist wouldn't know about which includes the processes of testing the concrete, making sure it has the correct reinforcement, having a rule of thumb of making sure that it can hold 10 times whatever the maximum weight is that you thought it could do. Because at the end of the day, um, the priority of the, the construction engineer is to make sure that the bridge doesn't fail and that people don't die crossing the bridge. Whereas a theoretical physicist works in a world of theory where there is very little consequence to coming up with a great idea. That's the difference of what you're going to experience going from an educational environment into the work environment. There are best practices and coding practices that you have to know that take your proof of concept to a production level uh, piece of code. And you need to learn those, those practices. I wish I knew them all as well as I could. I've worked with some great people that have taught me a lot in that field, but that is really critical. That is part of the craft of what you're going to need. And then the last point there is about being self-directed. So what I mean there is there is, and you know, trust me, I, I grew up in South Africa. I worked a lot in Africa. I know how different the culture is in Africa to say Europe or, or America or 
the East or anywhere really. Um, and it's often seen as um, impolite or disrespectful to ask a lot of questions, to, um, you know, you have to show deference to person who's in a, in a position of authority. Those are all good traits. We, we were all brought up with those. But when it comes to a work environment, especially in an early stage business, you can't wait for somebody to tell you what to do. You have to understand um, that you are being employed for to be able to solve problems and to add value to the business. And what that means is you have to have the mentality of trying to find the next logical step that you can do without waiting to be told to add value or to solve a problem. And that's why I said that having that context in the beginning makes that step so much easier. If you know the business is trying to accomplish this, if you know somebody is trying to do this, you then can figure out for yourself exactly what the next steps are. That's where asking questions, having that context is super important. So I cannot, it's given that these three um, skills are what you need on the general side. Then as far as technical skills, um, you know, I think being very familiar with these emerging frameworks that are coming out for AI, like Langchain, Streamlit, you know, all of these kind of frameworks that I'm sure in a year or two will be ubiquitous and very well known. I would learn as many of them as I can, pick one that you end up liking because that will become like knowing React, you know, back before it was really popular. Um, it will put you in a position where you can, you're more employable. Um, understand these sort of data science elements of how AI is being or you know, these kind of more technical aspects of LLMs. Um, so I would put RAG, vector databases, fine tuning, all of those elements where you can go and read some papers, really understand those elements. There'll be a lot of development in these areas. Internalizing that sort of research and applying it, I think is very good. And then um, lastly, on the product side, there'll be a lot of evolution because as we just discussed, it's a, it's a transition of how, it's a platform transition that we are undergoing in this next year. So that means that how we use AI is gonna change things from, I mean, chat interfaces is a very easy and quick implementation of how we can use them that will evolve. So you really need to stay on top of that. And as the shift happens, lots of these kind of existing infrastructure blocks will disappear. So you really have to become familiar with how these new interfaces and new um, means of interacting with uh, LLMs and AI uh, will become ubiquitous over the next year. So I think that's it. I hope I haven't flown through it too quickly. Last point before I forget. <laughs> the most important, you can forget everything that I just said, but of course, adaptability. Um, because things are evolving quickly, just enjoying that process and learning, I think is super important. Um, you know, so definitely do that. Um, last quick points. Port uh, so what would I say is essential to making sure that you can uh, get noticed in the in in the world of AI. I think you need to have a portfolio of projects. Uh, definitely have some experience in the field. So you know, look at getting involved um, with some open source projects. Um, make sure that what you end up applying from AI is not just a toy. It can't just be oh. I had this silly idea of doing X, Y, and do show that you could use AI in some meaningful way. Um, and one of the key skills for anyone working in AI is you need to be multidisciplinary. So you need to have a sense of, you know, the architecture, the data science, uh, the product, all of a sudden, all, all of these elements meld together in AI because it's a cross section of all of those. 
um, and then being able to learn and adapt and apply these skills faster than anyone else uh, out there. I think that's, of course, already, that's certainly what I would look for if I was employing someone, um, is to make sure that they can keep evolving as the industry evolves. Um, and of course, if you're looking to gain experience, you know, feel free to reach out to me. Uh, I have I, lots of projects that we could potentially work on, or I could point you in the direction of some friends who have some projects that we could work on. Um, I'm going to leave you with this quote, artificial intelligence is whatever hasn't been done yet. And that's by the great Larry Tesla in the 1970s. So quite a prof profound thought. And um, please feel free to reach out to me. And I look forward to uh, all the wonderful things you guys are going to be doing. And I hope we, we can all enjoy the change that's coming over the next few years. Okay, great. Thank you so much, Jack. I was hoping if we could have uh, some Q&A session, but time is running short. So thank you so much for taking us through the future of AI and how the, indust the industry is evolving. And our trainees are also diving into projects related to AI and your insights on the real world applications in different types of areas, uh, businesses was really helpful. And uh, yes, I think we're running out of time. So a big thank you, Jack, for dedicating your time to meet with our trainees and deliver this uh, presentation. So we truly appreciate it. Thank you so much, Jack. Great, thank you guys. Okay, thank you, have a good day. Bye. Okay, bye.